for posterity's sake, right? We have been in 1 John for quite a very long time. And tonight we're going to continue looking at complete love. And this is all in reference to John, 1 John 4, verses 11 and 12. And if I remember right, last week we got through what is love. And now we're looking at who's the neighbor. Who's the neighbor? Page 2, down at the bottom. Page 2, down at the bottom, who's the neighbor? And the reason we're asking this question is because in these passages we get this. Dear friends, or beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and His love is perfected in us. Now, loving one another, loving your neighbor as yourself, these are all teachings of Christ that John was witness to. And so now we're going to delve into the whole idea of who's the neighbor. Because that's an important aspect of what we're looking at here. Who is the neighbor? Now, in Jesus, in his idea of who the neighbor is, we get a, we get a glimpse in Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10, starting in verse 30. Jesus took up the question and said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers. Now, geographically speaking, the road from Jerusalem to Jericho is quite a treacherous path. Um, there are a lot of places in it in which you will be able to hide as a bandit and jump out and surprise people. So, the road to Jerusalem, uh, from Jerusalem to Jericho, was notoriously known for bandits in that day. So Jesus continues and says that they stripped him, beat him up, and fled, leaving him half dead. Which is not an uncommon occurrence at the time. Now, anybody passing by could have possibly said ah, to themselves, well, you know, maybe this guy laying on the side of the road is playing possum. And maybe there's friends of his that if I stop, well, they're, they're going to beat me too and, and rob me as well, right? So a priest happened to be going down that road. I, I mean, this, this is starting to sound like a real bad joke, right? A, a priest, a Sadducee, and a Samaritan are walking down the road, from you, right? <laughs> it sounded like a joke. But Jesus says, a priest happened to be going down that road when he saw him. He passed by on the other side. He passed by on the other side. Now, why would that be? Well, this was, we're talking about a priest. And priests had to remain ceremonially clean. So if that were a dead body, that priest, to maintain his cleanliness under the Levitical law, could not touch it, right? He would have been defiled and then had to have gone through all this biblical cleansing in order to repurify himself for <coughs> the priestly duties, right? So he doesn't take any chances and he sees this body laying on the side of the road and he just over to the other side and, you know, does nothing. In verse 32, Jesus continues and says, In the same way, a Levite, when he arrived at the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. So a Levite, Levite doesn't necessarily have to be the, the priest, right? But of, of the descendants of Levi, still trying to maintain cleanliness, Passes by on the other side. Verse 33. But. You know the punchline's coming when Jesus says, but. It says, but. A Samaritan. Now you know the Jews. Sorry. 
You know, the Jews, when they uh, heard this out of Jesus, but a Samaritan, oh, them Samaritans, yeah, bad people up there, the Samaritans. Those Jews didn't like the Samaritans. But Jesus says, but a Samaritan on his journey came up to him. And when he saw the man, he had compassion. A compassion is a very interesting word here because compassion encompasses a great deal of traits and attributes. Compassion is not just walking by and saying, Oh, I'm sorry to see you're like that. I'll pray for you and continue on. That, that is not what compassion is. When somebody says, Oh, they had compassion towards him, Verse 34 tells us what it looks like. That compassion looks like this. He went over to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring olive oil and wine. He's meeting this man's physical needs, having compassion for this man. The next day, he stayed with this guy for a whole day out in the wilderness on the road from Jerusalem to Jericho. A dangerous place. He stayed there with him, showing compassion, <coughs> bandaging his wounds, meeting his physical needs. The next day he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper and said, take care of him. When I come back, I'll reimburse you for whatever extra you spend. Jesus, did, Jesus is telling us that this Samaritan did what is necessary. He didn't wait and say, Hey, uh, you know, uh, what, what is your spiritual relationship with God? No, he didn't, didn't wait for that. Right? He didn't ask him, Where do you go to church? Do you go to temple? Are you even Jewish? You're not one of those Romans, are you? No, he didn't pull out any kinds of qualifications <coughs> as to what <coughs> enabled this Samaritan to display this <coughs> compassion, right? Instead, he just did what was necessary in order to meet this person's needs, right? Now Jesus asks the crowd around him, he says, which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers. Which of these three, the priest, the Levite, or the Samaritan, which proved to be the neighbor? Didn't, it's not the one, and Jesus is not asking, which one said they were a neighbor? Which ones claimed to be a neighbor? Which ones talked about being neighborly? He said, which ones proved? Which ones gave evidence? Which ones displayed the characteristics and traits of a neighbor? <coughs> the one who showed mercy to him, he said. Then Jesus told him, the one who's talking to, says, go and do the same. Go and do the same. The same. The Samaritan in this story had not asked for any qualifications to the compassion that he displayed. Right? The one who proved himself to be the neighbor is the one whom we should do the same as. This is, this is what Jesus tells us. Right? Now, why would that be the case? The reason for that is pretty easy for us to, to kind of figure out. And there's a lot of places in Scripture where we are told to do, to act. We have looked already in 1 John where we are to love in truth and action. We are not to be complacent in how we love others and how we show God's love. Now, again, I want us to 
keep in mind that we are not expected to go outside of our own abilities in showing that love. I am not supposed to pay your mortgage to show you that I'm a good neighbor to you. Okay? Because I can't do that. But, however, if I had that capacity, it would not be outside of the realm of possibility. But our showing love to others should not take us out of the realm of our ability. God does not ask us to put ourselves into jeopardy to show his love to other people. Okay? Although one could argue that this Samaritan did what he was able to do at that time despite the threats around them. Okay? One could argue that. I mean, later on the road from Jerusalem to Jericho, that's a dangerous road. But he stayed with this man. He showed compassion to this man who's fallen to the bandits. All right? It's an interesting he argument. He to didn't be made. know that the guy wasn't a uh, trap. Sure, yeah. He didn't know those things, right? But at the same time, we don't know more about the Samaritan than. He showed compassion to this man who needed compassion at that time, right? And we can, we can kind of move a little bit further and talk about this just as I, just as I aspect of Jesus' teachings. Jesus is filled with all of these different examples of Jesus saying, because I do this. You should do this too. Uh, John 13, verses 14 and 15. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done for you. So here Jesus has given us this wonderful example of modeling how we should serve others. We should not try or attempt to elevate our own status to not doing the dirty work, to not getting our hands dirty, or not doing the things that display the kind of love that we know God's shown to us through Christ. Right? Now, Remember, we're not talking about earning our salvation or meriting different kinds of things because we could never do that. What we're talking about is the progress of spiritual growth and in that spiritual growth that we have, one of the wonderful things is our desires being changed by God to help others, to show the love to others to demonstrate God's love in different ways, to, to exact the modeling that has been demonstrated to us in the scriptures of what Jesus has done. Right? John 13, verse 34, a little later on, Jesus says, I give you a new command, love one another, just as I have loved you, you are also to love one another. So this falls under the whole one anothering parts. We do these one anotherings. This is amongst ourselves, the family of Christ, the body of believers. You know, we should love one another in this way. Right? But he also says later, you know, we, we should love our neighbors. Love those who hate us. We talked about this last week. Love those who hate you and pray for those who persecute you. Because it's, I mean, how hard is it to love people who love you back? That's not hard. That's not difficult. That's not complicated. Well, it's easy to love that little baby, you know, when they love you back and they don't fight and talk back to you and they, they, you set them down and walk away and you come back and they're still there. Hey, that's the easy part, right? It's when they get a little bit bigger and they get a little bit independent and they get a little bit headstrong and, you know, that's when it becomes a little bit more, yeah, I see you waving back there, right? That's when it gets a little bit more difficult to love, but we should still do that. And then sometimes, you know what? Sometimes even the ones that we love just do not love us back. And they say it to our faces. 
and they don't care if they hurt you or not. Some people just don't like you and won't like you. But what does Jesus tell us to do? Love the way he loves. Right? Love the way he loves. Love the way he loves. John 15, 12, and 13. John 15. This is my command. Love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this to lay down his life for his friends. Now we have looked at this passage before in our study of 1 John. Laying down his life for his friends. I mean, this is a great love. I mean, we cannot outdo that kind of love, right? But we should, we should try. We should work hard to continue excelling in loving one another, right? Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 4, Let all bitterness anger and wrath, shouting and slander be removed from you along with all malice. Wow, that's hard, isn't it? Be removed from you, right? And then something that I heard all the time growing up, Ephesians 4.32, mom just kept saying it over and over and over and over. <coughs> And over and over, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving one another, just as God also forgave you in Christ. Did it work? Yeah, it stuck, that's for sure, it stuck, right? But be kind and compassionate to one another, and forgiving one another. Listen, God forgave us. How wonderful is that? God is forgiving. It doesn't matter. It does not matter how bad you think you are. It does not matter how crummy you think you've been. God is forgiving. And there's a, there's a period after that sentence. God is forgiving. You know, people have a real hard time forgiving one another. And this is why we're instructed to be as forgiving as God has forgiven us. Because it's not an easy thing to be forgiving. It's not simple as it sounds to be forgiving. Because we keep all these other things in our hearts. The bitterness, the anger, and the wrath. You know, well, I'm going to get back at that person, boy. Let me tell you, you know what they did to me? I was walking along in church and they stepped on the heel of my shoe and I got a flat tire on that shoe and they know, they know I hate that so much. I'm just going to get them back. What kind of shoes are you wearing? <laughs> flat tire. Well, it's called a flat tire when someone steps on the back of your pulls shoe and pulls it, pulls yeah. your foot out of it. Oh, it's, called, it's called a flat tire. Oh, man. You, gotta, you gotta sit down and you gotta fix it, and then if you gotta tie, untie, and do it all over, man, that's just irritating, isn't it? Man, I'm telling you, they, and they did it in church even. It's like trying to walk into church. That's they knew it. That, that's it. That's it. Right? Come on now. We know, be we know better than this, right? But we hold on to all of these things that Paul is writing about here. We hold on to bitterness. And we hold on to anger. And we hold on to wrath. Because it's easy to fall into that. Because that's our sin nature coming right out in the open. That That is... The fallen world that we live in, and you can see it all over the place out there in society, where, you know, I'm, I'm going to get back at that person. I'm, I'm going to get even. I'm going to get even. Well, there's no even. Yeah. Well, and no, let me rephrase that. We are all even. Because we're all sinners. We're all even already. We start off that way. We're all so even. <laughs> Some are a little more even than others. Yeah, animal farm. Okay, right? No, no. We are we are all fallen. We are all sinners. We are all undeserving of grace. We all have not merited 
anything, any kind of favor from God. Right? And this is why Paul is telling us, let that bitterness and let that anger and let that wrath just go away from you. Let it all go away. <laughs> the, the hatred, the shouting, slandering one another, just put it out of your life because it's just going to continue to corrupt and eat and hurt you and you're not going to be able to love those who, lo who, who hate you. You're not going to be able to love those. You're not going to be able to pay, pray for those people who are persecuting you if you hold on to these grudges and grievances. It's, it's not going to be healthy for you. You'll start losing your hair. Oh. What did you do? <coughs> I know. Well, we know it's not leprosy. We know it's, that's right. Leviticus tells us it's not le leprosy, right? Right? But be kind and compassionate. Kind and compassionate. The kind of the kind of compassion that Jesus is talking about, back up about the Samaritan. The compassion that was proved, the one who proved to be a neighbor. That's the kind of compassionate that we need to be. Right? Ephesians 5, verses 1 for 1 and 2. Therefore, be imitators of God. Imitators of God as dearly loved children and walk in love. That's interesting that he would say walk in love instead of standing in love or being seated in love. He says uh, to walk in love, to progress, to go forward in love, to move in love, to have love in action. It doesn't say run in love. No, because you're going too fast, you'll miss some things. But you got to walk in love. you got to continue on in love. As Christ also loved us and gave himself for us, a sacrificial and fragrant offering to God. Now, how about that? Equating the sacrifice and love that Christ had for us in what we should be walking in love as an offering to God. Ah, ah, think about that one now. Our love towards one another and our love towards the neighbors are like an offering offered unto God. All right? What does God desire? Does he desire the blood of bulls and goats? No, he desires a humble heart. That's what he desires. He desires us to be humble for him and to love and to love like he loved, to be imitators of that love. Philippians 2.2, make my joy complete by thinking the same way, having the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. Now this same love is the same love that he was talking about in Ephesians, the love that Christ displayed for us. Having that same love makes joy complete. Paul's joy is complete in writing to this church in Philippi, saying, hey, my joy is complete when you guys do this kind of love, loving the same way that God has. No, our love for one another and our love inside ourselves becomes complete when we see one another loving each other and others as God loves us. I mean, this is, this is all like a big ballooning thing, you know. You pour more love into the balloon, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. You pour more love into the balloon, it keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger, right? We keep, you keep showing love, I get joy out of it. I keep showing love, you should get joy out of it. It should be reciprocal in that way. Especially, especially because we're talking about the love that we have, that God has has demonstrated to us the imitating God's love in such a way that we see it and man it just fills you up. Right? When you see someone else doing things out of love, getting involved in different things that are going on in the church and in the community just to show people the love of God, boy doesn't that make you feel good even when you're not part of it. You just, oh, you heard about it you, 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 maybe you saw it on a video that we have posted, or, or maybe you, you heard about it in the newspaper or on the radio.
video or something like that? Doesn't that make you feel good? When you hear all these wonderful stories about people showing God's love in different ways, doesn't that make your joy grow? It should. Make it complete? It should. That's what Paul is saying here. Colossians 3, starting in verse 12. Therefore, as God's chosen ones, holy and dearly loved, put on compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving one another if anyone has a grievance against another. Just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you are also to forgive. Well, you know, I'm going to tell you, Tony, I will only forgive you if... <laughs> it don't work that way. It don't work that way. I've got to put on compassion and kindness, right? Like the Samaritan did. Put on that compassion and kindness. And be humble and gentle or meek, tender. And be patient. Patience is a hard thing. That's the hardest one. Isn't it? It's difficult. Patience is difficult. Because we live in such a fast-paced society where everything's at our fingertips. And we can go, 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 go. I can get information quick. Ah, got it. I mean, we can, be, we can move fast, right? Not if you're Kathy. Well, that's true. Hers, <coughs> hers is in, hers is in the rice. Hers is in but, the rice. But, but we got a fast-paced society. So it's hard for us to slow down and be patient and wait on one another, let alone waiting upon the Lord. Because the Lord's time is a different time frame than our time. What we want to happen, when we want it to happen, may not be what the Lord wants to have happen at that time. And we've got to wait. We have to be patient. And we have to be patient with one another. It's not easy. It's not easy. But, we, we're, we're cruising right along tonight, boy. Let me tell you, we might get through another page. <laughs> Quit laughing. <laughs> All right? We, we've got to keep growing. We, we've got to keep growing. Our growth is an important part of our spiritual walk. Our destination is not yet, so we've got to keep growing. This is the whole process and idea of sanctification. The sanctification is an ongoing growth process that we get closer and closer to God. 1 Corinthians 14.1 Pursue love and desire spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. Pursue love. And th those spiritual gifts that we're given by the Holy Spirit are, are not to be hidden. They're not to be put on the back burner. They're not something we do all by ourselves. You know, these are some things, sometimes they're shared in small groups. Sometimes they're shared in larger groups. Sometimes they're shared in uh, men's <coughs> groups or women's groups or with children. I mean, our gifts are all different and they should be pursued. We should go after what it is that we're good at, that God has blessed us with. We, we need to continue exercising those gifts, but we should pursue love. Pursue is implying a growth, a going on and on, and continuing in. Philippians 1.9 And I pray this, that your love will keep on growing in knowledge and every kind of discernment. Every kind of discernment. Keep on growing. The love keeps on growing in knowledge and discernment. That's an interesting way to put some things together. Some ideas. Love growing in knowledge. Love keeping on growing. Continuing on growing in knowledge. And every kind of discernment. Right? Why? Why? This is unique. This is a concept that is not very well drawn out here, but let's do that right now. Our love can keep, should keep on growing in knowledge. 
right? Well, think about this. When you continue to show love to people, people you know, people you love, people that love you, people that don't love you, you continue to interact with it. Because see, you, you, when we're talking about love here, we're talking about love not being something that I do in my closet by myself. Well, all right, I've never met these people, but I saw a picture of them in a bulletin. So I love them. And that's good, God, because I love them. I never met them. No, 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 no. See, our love is supposed to be in action. It's supposed to be a walk. So when we are active in our love, we get to know those whom we love. We develop relationships. We build the relationships. And they may, I may find out, boy, exactly how much they really don't like me. Right? But I keep showing that love. I keep continuing in that love. And I get a little bit more information about them. I get more knowledge about them. I get more knowledge about how to love them more effectively. I learn how to love them more precisely and individually. Right? How to pray for them. Maybe certain times, pray with them. Even if they don't like me, they may know that I've been praying for them. And you know what? They may hit that wall and say, look, Becky, I need you to pray for me. I know we haven't gotten on very well. I mean, we have hopefully had these experiences with people that we just know they just don't really like, like us that much. I said, I'm, I'm in a rough patch. I, I need you to pray for me. Because I, I know you're a praying person. Right? That's a, bit, that's a bit of knowledge in love, right? That's a bit of knowledge in love. And that discernment, I mean, we, discernment goes all over the place. We talked a lot about discernment in the chapter ago, which was what, January? <laughs> last year? Last, no, <laughs> wasn't that? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Colossians 2.2, 2. I want their hearts to be encouraged and join together in love so that they may have all the riches of complete understanding and have the knowledge of God's mystery, Christ. <coughs> Here again, we have understanding and knowledge associated with love. Isn't that unique? But this is a growth aspect, a, a growing knowledge. A growing understanding. Encouraging the hearts of one another. Right? First Thessalonians 1 3. We recall in the presence of our God and Father your work produced by faith, your labor motivated by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Endurance. Wow, endurance. <coughs> That's wonderful. Our hope in Christ, our certainty of salvation, our assurance in the solidity of that salvation and relationship with God should give us inspiration to endure and to continue and continue. A little later in chapter 4, verse 9, about brotherly love, you don't need me to write you because you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. See, this goes back to when we were talking about you can't love someone if you don't love God. You can't really love someone else if you don't love God. If you don't know and have that that relationship with God first, uh, you're really doing lip service to the word love when you talk about loving other people. Because then you're talking about it, how it makes you feel better, so then you're not doing it to glorify God. Uh, then you're talking about how it satisfies you or it brings you attention or things like that, and that's not glorifying God. So the love that you have really isn't 
that kind of love you should be having towards other people. Because you don't know the God-glorifying love and the love that God gives us that gives us hope and encouragement in Christ to have this hope-filled, eternal life that's down in our future. We look with great expectations. Hope is not the, boy, I hope I get a new bicycle for Christmas. It's not that hope. It's the hope with expectations. It's the looking forward with an expectation of something happening because of fulfilled promises that we have already seen. See, those are testimonies that work hand in hand. We serve a faithful God who is a fulfiller of promises. We can see it recorded throughout Scripture of God fulfilling His promises. And when God says that we shall be with Him in glory, when God says that we shall dwell with Him on a new heaven and a new earth, and we shall be there, we can have a certain assurance in that because of previously fulfilled promises. Like when He says to Abraham, I will make a great nation out of you, and I will bless the nations through you. And he did. And we can see that. So we have these promises that give our hope evidence and grounding and security. First uh, Timothy one five. Now the goal of our instruction is love that comes from a pure heart, a good conscience, and sincere faith. That's, that's the goal of what Scripture teaches us. This, this wonderful kind of love that is not self-gratifying. It's pretty interesting. Now, I know we're about out of time, and I got a lot more verses here. I'm not going to go through them all. I did not intend to, but I will point out a couple for you. And I, I would encourage you to, to take this home and look through the rest of this on how we should continue to grow, that our spiritual growth should be happening, and it should continue on, right? But a couple verses, Hebrews 10, 24, and let us watch out for one another to provoke love and good works. To provoke in one another <coughs> love and good works, right? So we should be encouraging to one another and provoking love and good works. That's, I like the way that, that sounds, provoking because it's not like you know provoking someone into hitting me. You know? Instead, you're provoking someone to, to love me. <laughs> yeah, that, sounds, that sounds good. All right? Or love someone else. Uh, to go out and love. So we should, we should be doing and acting in the, the various ways towards one another that encourage each other to go out and continue loving. Right? So Hebrews 10.24 is a good one. James 2.8 tells us that indeed, if you fulfill the royal law prescribed in the scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you're doing well. So, I mean, you're doing well if you're doing that. Because, you know, that's a hard thing to do anyway. I mean, <laughs> some neighbors are not too neighborly, right? Um, 1 Peter 2.17, honor everyone. Love the brothers and sisters. Fear God. Honor the emperor. Right? Love the brothers and sisters. One another. That's another, falls under the category of one anothering. There's a long list of one anothering. <coughs> That's one of them. Finally, this is 1 Peter 3, 8 and 9. Finally, all of you be like-minded and sympathetic. Love one another. And be compassionate and humble. Not paying back evil for evil or insult for insult, but on the contrary, giving a blessing. Since you were called for this so that you may inherit a blessing. We were not called to repay evil with evil, but we were called to inherit a blessing and bless others. To bless others, why? 
How? To bless others through the way that we love, so that we're showing the love of Christ, the love of God to other people, so that they can see what God has done for them. That God is a loving God, though He is also just and righteous and wrathful against sin, and the time will come when people will no longer ask the question, well, why does God let all this evil happen in the world? Be patient. That's why we need to be patient. Because God will take care of evil and sin. It's a promise. It will happen. I've read the end of the book. I know what it says, right? So the question is not, why doesn't God? It's, aren't you grateful God hasn't done it yet? So that you can get to know Him and Jesus, right? So that you don't have to fall into that, oh, woe is me. What have I done? Right? Above all, maintain constant love for one another since love covers a multitude of sins. We are, we are to maintain constant love. Because love is what God has shown us. And love is what God not only has shown us, but has modeled for us too. Right? I encourage each and every one of us to continue on in love with one another and to look for opportunities all this next week to love others, to love your neighbors. Find out which ones your neighbors needs love the most. Right? We got bunny we got a bunch of them. So there are no questions or observations or comments. We'll go ahead and close up in a word of prayer. Pausing. All right, let's go ahead and pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for your word and that you've demonstrated through your Son how much you love us and that we should model that same kind of love so that others can come to know the wonderful love through Christ. I pray that you would go with us tonight, that you would bring us back at the appointed time so that we can continue to fellowship, worship you, and to learn from your word. And this I pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen.